Father, we love you. We praise you. We adore you. Father, right now, we ask you to come into this place. Fill this place with your spirit, Father, as you filled the temple of old. Father, just let your fire fall down upon this place. And on each and every person here today, Father, we just lift this place to you. Father, we love you. We praise you. We adore you. We worship and honor you, Father, in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen and amen and amen. Thank you, Father. Oh, thank you, Father. Thank you. We worship you, Father, in Jesus' name. Isn't it great to be in God's house, to worship Him? Last week, we started talking a little bit about new stuff. Worshiping the Father. We serve a God of the new stuff, new things. And we we were coming home last night from Oklahoma City. Joy said, Bill, have you got your sermon ready for this morning? And I said, nope, still don't know what I'm going to talk about. This has been a tough week. I've been seeking God. I've been asking, what, Father, what what are we going to talk about this morning? And it's just like, whoa, Whoa. (laughs) I don't know. (laughs) And I had a couple little hints here and there, but nothing real definite about what to talk about. And then I got up, actually I woke up about probably around 4 o'clock this morning. And one word came to my mind, and it was unity. Unity. And I thought, wow, okay, where are we going to go with unity? But anyway... We serve a God of new stuff, and God is faithful. And so I get up this morning, and I get, open my Bible to my coordinates, and I look up the word unity. And there's three references. <laughs> three references. And I'm thinking, I need a bigger concordance. But anyway, we got to, to I got to, Getting in here and get to looking a little bit. Turn over to Acts chapter 1. A unity. How did the first church come together in unity? And what does it all mean? And I turned over and I turned. Acts chapter 1 popped in my mind. Or actually chapter 2 verse 1. It says, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all. All of them, the 120 believers at that time, that was the church. There was 120 Christians in the world at that time. Were all with one accord in one place. And the Greek word for one accord is homoth. Oh my, oh mad on. Think that's how you pronounce it? I'm not for sure, but Charlie's our Greek scholar here. Uh, anyway, you spell it H O M O T H U M A D O N. Homothomadon, I would guess, would be how you would pronounce it. Huh? No, actually, it's yeah, it's Greek. Yeah, being unanimous, having mutual consent, being in agreement, having group unity, having one mind and purpose. The disciples had an intellectual unanimity or an emotional rapport, a vocational agreement in a newly founded church. In each of its occurrences, that Greek word homothematon shows a harmony leading to action. And as I got to dwelling on what we talked about last week, God being the God of the new stuff and 
and how the church started, how they started, they were all in agreement. Everything they done, they were all in agreement. If we want to see God do what God wants to do with this church and what God wants to do in this town, we have got to stay in agreement. We have got to be in that Honda in one accord. We just, we got to be. We can't have disagreements. And, and not saying that we're not always going to agree on everything. Disagreement sometimes is good, but we sit down and we talk about it. We just don't get mad about it and go somewhere else. We sit down and we talk about it. So, hey, this is what I think. You know, we don't do like, like the guy, over, the Archbishop of Oklahoma, we got a church over here that's got 500 members, 300 active members, and it's just, oh, well, we're just going to do away with it because I said so. That's not being in agreement. That's not working together as a community. And we are a community of believers. Not just us, but all of the churches in town. And you know, I'm thankful for our ministerial alliance. We get, the ministerial alliance in this town does a lot of things and they get a lot of things done. Now once in a while it seems a little one-sided, but you know, we're working on it. But all of the churches get together. You know, all of the pastors in this town try to get together once a week for you know, prayer for a half hour, 45 minutes around noon, just to pray for each other, to pray for each other's churches. A couple of weeks ago, we met here, and they were going, wow, this is nice. You know, they had never been here. A couple of them had been in, you know, but for the most part, they hadn't been here, but they come in, they go, wow, this is nice. you got a lot of room in here. I said, yeah, we got a nice church. God is doing things, but we have got to stay in unity. So I got to kind of flipping through this morning, and I've got a little program in here, and you can type in different words and do word searches and stuff. And So I come up with a lot of scriptures, and we're going to cover uh, quite a few scriptures this morning. All of them have to do with unity, being in one accord, being in agreement, and different things like that. Acts chapter 1, verse 14. Just right on the same page with most Bibles. Some of you may have to turn back a page. These all continued in one accord. All. All of them. The whole 120 stayed in one accord. In agreement. In prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and his brothers. They were in agreement. And then what happens? Just a short time later, a few days later, when Pentecost came, they were still in one house. They were still in agreement. They were all praying. This, basically, they were all praying the same thing for God to manifest himself, for God to make this thing mold together and become one like a, like a clay pot. You take a big old glump of mud and you make a bowl out of it, and it's solid, and it, and it holds water. It holds things together. You plant flowers in it, and it holds the roots together. That's what they were doing. They wanted this thing to grow into something bigger than they were. Acts chapter 12, verse 12. Last part of that verse, where many were gathered together praying. They were all, here again, they are all gathered together. They're all in one place. They're all praying. They're all praying for the same thing. They're praying for God to move in miraculous, marvelous ways. Uh, Psalm 133. We'll start in verse 1 and go through about verse 3. And behold... How good and how pleasant it is for brethren, for believers, for people of like faith to dwell together in unity. 
It is like precious oil upon the head, running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron, running down to the edge of his garment. Charlie was teaching us one time when they anointed Aaron. Back in the old days, when they anointed you with oil, they anointed you with oil. They dumped oil on him, it run down his hair, down through his beard, and it gathered in the hem of his garment there was so much oil. But that's what it's talking about, unity. The, the Holy Spirit coming on us and keeping us in unity, keeping us together, keeping us looking for that, building that one thing that God wants built. God wants this community to come together as one. And if we can get this community to come together as one, we can start working on the county and the state and may, eventually our nation and we can maybe hopefully divert some of this disasters that are obviously coming. We've already seen some with, you know, the hurricanes like Katrina and the one that came a couple years later that hit uh, south, southern Texas, you know, down in and around Houston and in there just, just like what, six months after Katrina hit, we had another big one hit, you know, and... The tornado, tornadoes have been going nuts in this country the last couple of years. They're having tornadoes in places where they've never, they don't even know what a tornado looks like. Yeah. Having tornadoes when it ain't tornado season, you know, and earthquakes. Who would have ever thought that Oklahoma would have more earthquakes than any other place in the country? We had more earthquakes last year than the whole country had. I hope this new building they're building down there is earthquake safe. <laughs> but when a country turns its back on God, and this country has since 1963 pretty much just gradually turned its back away from God. We started with one person getting prayer taken out of school. Then we got abortion coming in. And I, re I heard a statistic a month or so ago on TV that there has been over a half a million babies killed in the United States. And it may be more than that. I can't remember the exact number, but it, was a, it just blew me away. How many babies that have been killed in this country since 1972 or 3, whenever they legalized abortion? A country cannot keep turning its back a nation, a people, a congregation cannot keep turning its back on God without incurring God's wrath. We can see it throughout the Old Testament with the people of Israel. I mean, all of the miraculous things he done in Egypt to get them out of there, and the first thing they start doing when they hit the water is they start griping at Moses and says, look what you've done. You drug us out here in the middle of the, the desert. We got water in front of us and we got Pharaoh and his armies behind us. They're going to kill us. You idiot. You know, they don't get two days away and they're already griping and complaining. And what happens? God shows his miraculous power. He tells Moses, hold up your stick. Moses, hold up his stick and the sea goes... And they walk through on dry land. I love, I love when Charlie was teaching us about that. He said, was it Caleb? When Moses said, go into the water, Caleb stepped into the water. Water hadn't parted yet. He kept walking. The water got up to his nose. He couldn't take another step without going under. And when he took that, started to take that last step, Ocean parted. Joshua and Caleb believed everything God told them. They were the only, pretty much the only two. They were the two of the ten that went into the promised land and come back and everybody said, oh man, dude, them guys got big grasshoppers. You know, we look like little big grasshoppers. These giants. They got grapes, clusters of grapes big as us. We can't beat them. Joshua and Caleb come back and said, hey, dude, get out of the way. Let me show you. We can whoop them. 
We can do it. But the people listen to the eight instead of the two. So they didn't take another lap around the mountain. Yeah. Spend 40 years out there walking around in circles. Because they wouldn't listen to what God was saying. They, they couldn't get in unity. They couldn't get in agreement. They were always separated. They were always dysfunctional, basically. A big dysfunctional family. They couldn't agree on anything. But God wanted them to go in. It's only, what, a week's week at the most walk from Goshen to Israel? Uh, yeah. You know, it took them 40 years to what, do what they should have done in seven days. Six, because they, they couldn't walk on Sunday or Saturday. Sat, the Sabbath was Saturday. So, you know, Sunday, they could, on, you know, they could have gone on six days. It took them 40 years. We don't want to be like that. We want to hear what God has to say. And we want to do it. We want to be in agreement. We want to stay in unity. Ephesians uh, 4, 3. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit. God wants us, the Holy Spirit will lead us. But we have to stay in unity with the Spirit. And one way we do that is staying in unity with each other. When, when we start letting the devil drive wedges between, each, between us, the Spirit can't do what the Spirit wants to do. We have to keep that unity of the Spirit in us. On the, going down to verse 13, and it says, Till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. Unity. That word is scattered throughout our Bible. God talks about unity. Unity of the Spirit. Unity of faith. Faith is we believe things that are not as though they were. We believe when we pray for people, they're going to get well. My Bible says that when we anoint somebody and pray for them, they will recover. We have to believe that. We can't override their will. That, and that's been a big hang-up for me because I see what the Bible says about us laying hands on people and anointing them with oil and they get better they will get they will get healed but i you know i've prayed for people and they didn't get any better and charlie and i've talked about it they have to be at the same place faith wise as we are if their faith isn't there yet if they're not able to accept all of that then it's hard for us, for the Spirit, to do what the Spirit wants to do because they've got to have the faith to believe that God can do it. You know, in, I don't remember where it's, I think it's where this, the father took this young, his young son to the disciples and they couldn't heal him. He had epilepsy. He would, he would have seizures and, and, you know, back then... We call it epilepsy today. They have seizures and stuff, epilepsy. Back then, they were demon-possessed. They didn't know, you know. And I still think they're probably right and we're probably wrong. We call stuff a medical term that's actually Satan doing things to people. And we need to start taking authority over that. But the, the, the disciples, they had just been out. They had seen all kinds of miracles done. But they couldn't cast this one out. They couldn't make this boy better. So he brings him to Jesus. Jesus has been up on the mountain praying. And the father brings him to Jesus and, and says, I took my son to your disciples and they couldn't help him. They couldn't do anything for him. 
I know you can help him. You can make him well. And Jesus said, if you can believe. And the father says, I believe. Help my unbelief. That sounds like a contradiction in terms. I believe, but help my unbelief. <coughs> to me, that is, you know, Jesus is talking, the words are in red, so we know it was a master talking. That has an effect on us when we anoint people and pray over them. If their belief is not there, then we're going to have trouble getting them to that point of healing. We have got to help get their faith to the point that they believe it. We know it. We believe it. We know it. But we've got to get them to where they know it. And we've got to help them get to that point. And we can do that as a unified group of believers. We can help. We can help teach we can help each other learn the different things that we need to do to help people that don't believe strong enough to get there. And it's, it's tough because I fully, I believe every time, because my Bible says, do you lay hands on the sick and they will recover? Greater works than these will will you do God Jesus told us that the same the things he done while he was walking on this earth he expects us to do and bigger and better and greater things than what he done but we've got to stay united we've got to stay in the same faith believe in it 2 Corinthians 30 12 tells us singleness of heart so over there, look at that real quick. No, Second Chronicles. I'm sorry. There's not 30 chapters in Corinthians. That would be another one of those. Y'all read Mark 17 or whatever next week. <laughs> Second Chronicles 30, 12. And also the hand of God was on Judah to give them singleness of heart to obey the command of the king and the leaders at the word of the Lord. We have got to stay with, in one heart and one mind. If we will, if we will start getting, that, getting a hold of that as a group, as a, as a small group, there is nothing that can limit what God can do through this little church. This little church won't stay little very long. It will grow and it will thrive. And it will be because we will be teaching people what God wants them to be taught. We will be teaching to unify them, to bring them together. Understand that we are all under God's protection. If we will stay in that secret place, He will cover us with his wings like a mother hen covers her baby chickens and protect us. Philippians 4, 2. Be of the same mind in the Lord. Philippians, it's a great book. There is some awesome stuff Paul talks about in there. Paul is talking about Two different ladies in Philippi that were basically buttonheads. Uh, Eurodia and what's that other one, Charlie? Six. Huh? Sintite, okay. Cindy, there we go. I implore you 
Be of the same mind in the Lord. Help those who labor with me in the gospel. And be of the same mind. Be, a, be of one accord. Be of one spirit. Be of one faith. It all ties together. Be of one mind in the Lord. Acts chapter 4 verse 32 tells us to be united in heart and mind. First Peter three eight, be of one mind. Philippians three sixteen and seventeen. Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk in the same rule, let us be of the same mind. Brethren, join in following my example. And note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern. Paul is talking about be of one mind and imitate me. Do as, follow the example that, that I have set before you with all of the other believers. Be of one mind. Be joined together as one. Philippians 2.2 2. Being like-minded minded, having the same love being of one accord of one mind we say that word accord being of like-minded we want to we all want the same things we want to see God manifested and God exalted that's what it's all about it's not about